All right, why don't we go get, get ahead and get started. It's a few minutes after three here in Seattle. So uh, for those of you who joined uh, from elsewhere, my name is Roy Barnes. I'm a professor of astrobiology here at the University of Washington. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Professor Sarah Keller from uh, the chemistry department here at our very own University of Washington. Uh, when looking through uh, Sarah's bio, uh, I saw it was very long. She's had a distinguished career with many awards. Um, I've tried to distill it down to a few things that I think were uh, the big highlights, so hopefully she'll agree. Um, Sarah began her career at uh, Rice University where she got a bachelor's degree in physics. She then went on to Princeton uh, for her PhD also in physics. Uh, she came to the uh, University of Washington in 2000, uh, joining, in the year 2000, joining our, our chemistry department. Uh, she has uh, won the uh, Biophysics Avanti Award. She is a member of the uh, Washington State Academy of Sciences. Uh, she has been a fellow, she's a fellow of the American uh, Chemistry Society. And she was also a dean here for uh, the university in, in charge of research uh, from 2010 to 2014. And that's just a small sampling of uh, some of the things she has done. Uh, so we're really delighted to hear uh, today about some of this uh, research that she published uh, last year. Uh, I'm certainly excited because uh, it looks very exciting to, to see what uh, she has been doing in terms of the origin of life. And so um, and I'm gonna, before I hand it over to her though, I want to just uh, say a couple things about the format. Uh, today. It's, if you've been attending these uh, seminar series lectures, you kind of already know what to expect here, but basically um, I've been asked all of you uh, to please mute your microphones and stop your video feed to give Sarah all the bandwidth she needs for any animations or videos she might be showing. Um, also, um, if you, I'm going to hold all questions until the end. Um, if you have a question for Sarah about anything that she's presenting today, please type that into the chat room and I will uh, ask uh, her your question at the end of uh, the hour. So um, I think that takes care of it all. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to, Sel to Sarah for today's lecture. Please oh, this, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I, I do wanna say I was only a Dean Lett. I was an associate Dean, but it was still a wonderful experience. So today I'm going to tell you a story about using membranes to concentrate molecules in life processes. And I want to start right off and give the credit where it is due. So although I am giving you, I'm the one presenting this talk, I am not the hero of this story. So the primary hero of the story is Roy Black. He's a retired biochemist from Amgen and he came to uh, have a conversation with me several years ago about the question of could prebiotic membranes have helped biopolymers to form. So the way that I'm going to structure this talk is to give you a bit of an introduction then to go back to some some older research that that was brought by Roy to my laboratory and then take you to more current topics as we go along. Okay, so here was Roy's big idea of could membranes help the biopolymers to form? And the idea is that if we start off in some initial scenario in which there are bases and sugars, amino acids, fatty acids, how do we end up with something that looks like a protocell? Okay, so that would have a, a membrane around the outside and then on the, uh, on the inside or at least associated with that membrane, there should be some way of conveying information such as RNA, there should be uh, perhaps protein involved in there, and there are different ways to get from here to there. But what I had not been aware of before Roy walked into my office is that most of the work in this area has thought about taking individual bases um, and making them into RNA taking individual amino acids, making them into protein, and then putting those together with a membrane in order to make that protocell. And Roy's uh, fairly unique idea about this was, could it be that the membrane, which self-assembles on its own, so this is a downhill process, um, a spontaneous process of making that membrane of self-assembly, um, could the presence of that membrane help to facilitate making those biopolymers. So that's really the overarching theme behind this entire talk. So today's talk, oh, I just wrote two stories at the top of there, that's incorrect. I'm gonna tell you three stories. The first story is about building, uh, uh, involves small building blocks of RNA, specifically the bases. The second story is 
concerning the small building blocks of protein, specifically amino acids, individual amino acids. And the third story is about larger building blocks, compound building blocks, um, both of proteins and of RNA. Okay, why is a membrane-centric outlook appealing? So my, my training is in physics, and uh, even though I was doing biophysics, I have been doing biophysics for a very long time, still my, my understanding of biology is still a little bit limited. So in my minimalist physicist picture of the first protocell, it is that there is a bag that contains RNA. And even as a physicist, I can make the bag. So the bag cannot be that hard it's straightforward um, with some caveats. But what's very hard is the RNA. So let's make a parts list. In this minimalist cell, we have a membrane. That membrane, in, if we're thinking about an abiotic system, a prebiotic system, should have been made out of a fatty acid. We need a fatty acid that's long enough to, be, to make a stable membrane, but also short enough to have been prevalent in a prebiotic system. Um, the one that we're going to use is decanoic acid. So no biology required. If it's long enough, it makes that membrane. And now what are the bits of the RNA? There are four types of bases within RNA. There's also ribose, the sugar, so where it gets its name, ribonucleic acid, and also phosphate, and that's going to link the particular units together. Okay, so here's how things went. Uh, Roy joined the lab as, as a place to explore some of these ideas. He started talking to Matt Blosser. Um, they started doing some microscopy together. Together, uh, they recruited Mosh, and then that led to bringing in Caitlin Cornell to do some types of experiments that blossomed into to recruiting another undergraduate, Andrew, then now Zach, and as well, Peter Duff. And from that, those initial results led to funding from NASA, which is now supporting a large group to think about these problems that we've now joined up with Goyka Lalich's group, Gary Drobny's group, and also Kelly Lee's group. So I'm going to try all along the way to tell you the, to show you the publications, which will give you the names of the people who did that work. But again, these are the heroes of the story rather than me. Okay. I asserted that it's fairly straightforward to make a membrane shell. So in the, the terminology in, in that case of a, of a membrane shell is called a vesicle. So it has water on the inside, water on the outside. Those are fairly easy to make, except in salt. So let me describe what you're seeing in this picture. On the left, there's a test tube, and it contains simply decanoic acid molecules in water and all on their own, these bags self-assemble. So here's a scale bar of 20 microns. So these are, are huge. They're straightforward to image by fluorescence microscopy, although there's a lot of background noise. Um, and you'll notice that they aren't all spheres. You know, some of these can be elongated, but they're still large, lovely bags. And the exception to that is what happens in salt. So in this case, many of those individual bags have glommed together. And the, the technical word for glomming is flocking um, or flocculation. And here is what you call a, a big flock. Um, the scale bars are the same here. So this entire scale bar is also 20 microns. So that means that these are very large structures uh, they scatter light like crazy, as you see over on the right-hand side. And these collapsed structures presumably are not so great for forming protocells. This is a problem because significant salt concentrations could have been present, um, whether in oceans or in pools. So uh, how to solve that problem? Okay, so we have two different classes of fundamental problems. One is how to build RNA from its components. And another one is how to maintain stable membranes. And here are three fundamental problems within that, that class of, of, of category of problems. So the first one is, how were the bases of RNA selected? There are, are many possible 
faces that would have been possible. Why did RNA only end up with four faces? Um, how are they concentrated? If there was a dilute solution, how did they end up concentrated in one region? And how could individual vesicles have survived in a salty solution? I'm going to take these questions one by one as I go through the data, but I'm going to spill the beans right at the beginning. And I'm going to tell you that a possible answer to all of these questions is that um, that bases bind to the membranes and that interaction helps these different things occur. It's interesting giving a talk uh, online because I'm used to stopping at this point and asking for questions, but I realized that Rory asked you to go ahead and type your questions now and then we'll answer them at the end. All right, so let's go back to this first question. How are the bases of RNA selected? We tested a panel of bases. I am showing you this, these, uh, these data, the, the, the outline of how we did these experiments in physicist view, which means I'm not showing you the structures. The four bases that are on the top are the bases that are involved in, in RNA, in the RNA structure. The T that's over on the right-hand side, that is a nucleobase that's in DNA instead of in RNA, and then the other ones um, are ones that are not found in either RNA or in DNA. And here are the structures for them. So for RNA, we've got adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and then that T would be thymine, which is in DNA. And my question to you is, just looking at those structures, could you have predicted which of those would be the nucleobases? I would not have, but perhaps you would have. Okay, um, Roy suggested a filtration assay, and we're going to separate the fatty acids from the unbound bases. So here's the idea. Each one of these large rectangles is uh, an aqueous solution. On the top here, we have a mixture of fatty acids and a bunch of the base. And then as we spin the system down, some of those individual fatty acids are going to leave the place, leave the portion where the fatty acids are and go into solution. In this case on the left, there's a higher amount of binding of that fatty acid, of the fatty acid to the um, base than on the right hand side. And from that, we can quantify how much of each of those bases is retained with, in this case, these are our micelles, but here you can substitute in uh, fatty acid structure if you would prefer. Okay, I've been speaking quickly, so let me take a moment and walk through this one by one. On the x-axis, there are a bunch of different prebiotically plausible bases. Only two of them, the ones on the left here, guanine and adenine, are the ones that are found in RNA, and it turns out that those two stick the best, are retained the best with, or another way to say that it is bind to fatty acid surfaces. Okay, on the right hand, those are the purines. Uh, let me go back a couple of slides. Those are the purines, the ones on the left hand side of this slide. So those are the ones that have two ring structures. Now what about for the pyrimidines, the ones that are on the right hand side? So that's a, a single ring structure. And those are found here on the right hand side of this slide. So uh, first of all, adenine is repeated. Why did we repeat it? Because we're looking at things that are at different concentrations. So that allows us to normalize between the two. And then on the right hand side, there are the different bases that are prebiotically plausible that are pyrimidines. And it is usually, but not 100% of the case, usually the case that those bases that are involved in either DNA or RNA are the ones that are retained best with the micelles. So this is pretty fascinating. It, it says that Roy's hypothesis that um, there's an interaction that goes 
between the bases and the membrane could be something that helps get a selection of those individual nucleobases. So that first step of the scenario is plausible with respect to the nucleobases. If we think about only the bases and the fatty acids, it could be that particular bases bind to that membrane the best. Now the question is why? It's not simply a matter of the hydrophobicity, which was my initial assumption. Um, what we're seeing on the x-axis is hydrophobicity and uh, on a particular log scale. And then on the y-axis is the retention with the micelles. And what you can see is that this is basically a scatter plot. Um, there may be, uh, no, there's not, because look at this, this one is too high. So there's really not a good correlation here at all. What could it be instead? Well, this is a fatty acid. So uh, fatty acids make good membranes and about half of them are charged. And so it might have to do with the charge of the base. The way that chemists talk about the charge of the base is by talking about a, a term which is the pKa of the conjugate acid. And for those of you who don't speak acid-base chemistry, let me tell you that that's the pH below which the base is positively charged um, as a whole in the aqueous solution. And now we can look at the y-axis, which is the percent retained with the micelles. And here we do see a better correlation, but it's still not fabulous. Look at, look at this point for guanine and this point for two aminopurine. Um, a, a huge difference despite having the same pKa. Okay. So the two stories, two bits of data that I just told you about uh, relate to these two different questions. How are the bases of the RNA selected and how are they concentrated? And that could have been plausibly achieved via the uh, binding of bases to the membranes. What about this next question? How could individual vesicles have survived in a salty solution? So going back to this problem, when there is decanoic acid in solution without salt, big, beautiful vesicles with salt, there's this problem of flocculation. And the question is, does binding of nucleobases help solve this flocculation? Uh, this is a long and subtle story, but to, to make that story simpler, uh, I'll, I'll simply say yes. Um, in a case where we have both salt and adenine in the solution, then we get back vesicles again. So here is a, a rather low resolution picture of one of these vesicles. And one, another way to see it is by looking at the light scattering of the solution. These um, large open vesicles do not scatter light very much. When you make a big flock, they, it scatters light a lot and then goes back again to not scattering light as much. Okay, so if, if those were difficult for you to see, depending on the resolution of your screen, I've outlined where some of those individual vesicles are. These two ideas of binding of the bases to the membrane and the stabilization of the membrane are connected. So if we look at the amount of binding to the membrane, so this is the uh, percent of base that's retained with the micelles for both the purines, which is on the left-hand side, and the pyrimidines, which are on the right-hand side, then if we look at the reduction in scattering, right? I just told you that there's less scattering when we have individual large vesicles. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, then there's a positive correlation for both the purines and for the pyrimidines for this to happen. What does that say? That, that leads to a positive feedback. So vesicles to which bases are bound, so fatty acid vesicles and membranes to which bases are bound are stabilized against flocculation. What does that do? That makes more membrane available for the bases to bind. Stable vesicles present more area to bind bases and sugars. Uh, more binding of bases and sugars helps to guard against flocculation, so a positive feedback loop. 
Um, this is a story that not only we liked a lot, but it turned out that the economist liked it a lot. So we were very pleased about that. All right. Uh, the next story that I'm going to tell you about is binding small blocks of proteins. So here we had RNA, its individual bases. Um, now I'm going to talk about proteins and their individual amino acids. There are many different stars of this story, so let me tell you their names. Here's Caitlin Cornell, uh, Roy Black, Meng Jun Shui, uh, Jonathan Litz, Andrew Ramsey, Moshe Gordon, Alexander Milliant, uh, Zach Cohen, uh, and, and other people that are involved in this project. I think that the, the PIs are perhaps less interesting than the students are. So now we're going to talk about the building blocks of proteins. Those building blocks are amino acids. Here's our basic question. Do amino acids bind to decanoic acid vesicles? And do they stabilize the membrane against high salt? for example, in the same way that those bases did? And do they stabilize the membrane against divalent cations? Now, why am I making this distinction between salts in general and divalent cations? And that's because particularly magnesium is needed for RNA catalysis. And so if we, we want our eventual protocell to be able to undergo catalysis, then we need for it to be stable in the presence of magnesium. And once again, um, I'm going to tell you a story in which the answer to these is yes. Okay. So first off, that, that first answer being yes is that amino acids bind to decanoic acid vesicles. And the, the way to do this was by diffusion NMR, which is why we appreciated especially the expertise of the Drobny group in order to attack this problem. Okay, so let me introduce you to this. Here is a, a square of the NMR magnetic field strength on the x-axis and on the y-axis is a log scale of an intensity. And rather than getting into the theory behind how diffusion NMR works, what I want to tell you is that uh, there's going to be some lines and the slope of that line is going to tell us how many different environments a molecule finds. Well, what kind of molecule are we looking at? We're looking at amino acids, four amino acids in particular. The first one is just a positive control. This one is lysine. It's positively charged. Um, it should bind to negative fatty acids. The next one in the line is leucine. Leucine is relatively hydrophobic. Yeah, under those scenarios, I would expect some binding to a fatty acid membrane. The next two are glycine and serine. These are less hydrophobic and we expect less binding. What happens when these individual molecules, these individual amino acids, are in solution without any membrane? No decanoic acid. Okay, so if you imagine that scenario in your head, there's a test tube, it just has water, and it has individual molecules of amino acids. Those individual molecules of amino acids are diffusing around with Brownian motion. They don't have anything to stick to. They should just be undergoing free diffusion. And the number of slopes on this graph relates to the number of environments. We have only one environment of those individual amino acids diffusing around. So we get a series that uh, for each individual amino acid only has one slope. So let's look at the, the lightest marker here for lysine and it has just one slope there. Okay, now obviously what's interesting is what happens when we put those amino acids in the presence of decanoic acid. So here we have the same type of plot. And if we look at a control, which is just water, well, water should just diffuse freely. So great, it does. There, there's only one slope here. It diffuses freely. Excellent. What happens with our other molecules? Huge difference, right? Just striking. There's two components here. There's one slope 
that relates to fast diffusion. So this is still the same slope as we had before. So these are unbound amino acids. That makes sense. Some fraction of those amino acids are not bound to the membrane. But then what happens down here? Then this diffusion really slows down. That diffusion coefficient is about 100 times slower. And the presence of that says that those amino acids are now binding to the surface of the vesicles. OK, so the conclusion is individual amino acids bind to vesicles. Now let's go back to Roy's hypothesis. The first step of Roy's scenario is plausible with respect to the amino acids. If you have a bunch of individual amino acids in the presence of a membrane, there will now be binding. So now there's a concentration of those molecules that are important for the biopolymer formation. What I've just shown you is that the presence of the fatty acid membrane affects the amino acids, right? Their, their diffusion coefficient really uh, becomes much slower, an order of 100 slower, because they are now binding to the membrane. But binding is always a two-way street. If the fatty acid membrane is affecting the amino acids, it must also be the case that the amino acids have some effect on the membranes. And the question is, can we measure it? So let me remind you what you would see if there were no amino acids whatsoever in this, in this system. There, here we have a, a bit of a test tube that contains only decanoic acid. It self-assembles on its own to make vesicles. Um, you can see some, some faint outlines of where those vesicle edges are. Okay. Uh, those vesicles have a few layers. They have from one to a few layers of, of membrane. Um, kind of like onion rings, except the inside of the onion is empty in this case. Um, and so that's, that's what we had seen before. The language that we would use, the scientific terminology, is to say that those are posse lamellar, which just literally means few layers. Okay, what happens when there are amino acids in the system? If we start with something with a, a high hydrophobicity, if we're, sorry, if we start with something with a low hydrophobicity, serine, and then we're going to go toward the right, which is increasing hydrophobicity, you'll notice a huge difference immediately in the serine picture versus the no amino acid picture. Now, instead of having these very faint membranes, we have very bright membranes, and that's because we have onions in which we have layers all the way down uh, toward the middle. So many, many layers rather than a few layers. That persists to glycine and then goes away with leucine. So the picture for leucine looks a lot like the picture when we had no amino acid whatsoever. All right, that's for decanoic acid without any salt. Remember how there was this problem of, of what happens in the presence of a lot of salt that it could make the membrane do odd things? Um, so we want to investigate that. Now, I made an assertion back here that the, the membranes that have no amino acid or that have leucine could be posse lamellar, could have a few layers, and that the ones with serine and glycine have many layers. And it's difficult to, to have a feeling for that just by looking at fluorescence microscopy, because fluorescence microscopy, by definition, is limited to length scales of about a micron. We'd like to look at individual vesicles. And the way that we did that was through a collaboration, um, especially with Caitlin Cornell, working with, uh, the, with Kelly Lee's lab and Alex Milliant. So here on the left-hand side is a fluorescence micrograph that you saw before. And here on the right is cryotransmission electron microscopy, which allows us to visualize length scales that are much smaller. And now we can see the individual layers of the decanoic acid vesicles. So in some cases, there's just one layer, and then in other cases, there are nested layers. Okay, what happens with serine? This big bright ball that you see in the fluorescence micrograph is actually made of many, many layers, one on top of another of those uh, decanoic acid vesicles.
Okay, so that's just by eye. There's a huge difference. You don't have to rely on looking at the by eye. You can also uh, tabulate all of the different numbers of uh, the percent of vesicles that have each different number of bilayers per vesicle. And you can see that there's a shift in the filled in the dark blue lines versus the open lines of larger numbers of, of lamellae. Now, this was a very painfully slow technique. Uh, is there a faster way to, uh, to survey whether all amino acid, um, all of the amino acids increase the number of lamellae, the number of layers in our vesicles? And yes, and we can do that again by a, a change in turbidity. More layers make a more turbid uh, system. So it's going to scatter light more. Serine had a big effect. That's the one that I just showed you. And then other amino acids have much smaller effects. OK, why would you care about having more layers in a membrane? Um, I think that usually when we draw pictures of what we would imagine the first protocell should look like, we usually draw pictures like I drew in the first slides, where there was only one layer of a membrane. Could you really want more layers? What would that help you do? In this case, it would help stabilization against magnesium. And remember, we need magnesium in order to um, have the RNA function properly. So here's the picture I just showed you before. If we have no amino acids, then there are individual uh, possible lamellar membranes, many, many membranes for serine and glycine. What happens now when there's magnesium? Something terrible happens. If we have no amino acid in our system, we get collapse of those vesicles. So not good for making a protocell. What happens instead if there is serine in the solution? Now we retain those multilamellar structures and they don't collapse anymore. What if we go up here to where leucine was? Um, the, remember the leucine looked a lot like the case in which we had no amino acid and in fact it behaves the same way as well in the presence of magnesium. So there's collapse of those vesicles in the presence of magnesium. So not having those vesicles collapse is fantastic. It's a way to, uh, to retain the, uh, the behavior of a protocell in the system. So here again, we have a positive feedback loop. Vesicles to which amino acids bind are stabilized against magnesium. Stable vesicles present more area to bind more amino acids, binding more amino acids then helps make more membrane that's available. Um, we liked this story a lot. We were thrilled that the Atlantic liked this story a lot. They, they wrote a story only about our results. It was really thrilling. And SciShow also liked the story. So that was a lot of fun. OK, so despite the incorrect title here, I am not going to tell you two stories. I'm going to tell you a bonus third story which is about the compound building blocks of proteins and of RNA. And the, the first bit that I'm going to tell you about are some preliminary results. I've shown you before in the, in the last story that individual amino acids, um, in, in this case uh, serine in particular, bind well to vesicles that are made of decanoic acid. And the question is, do the dimer and the trimer as well? Um, the reason that this question is interesting is because in order to make a protein, um, a, a functioning protein, a functioning protein should have a string of many amino acids. But how would one go from one amino acid to an entire string of amino acids? Um, to help that along, it would be nice to find a place where it's advantageous to have two amino acids bound to each other or three amino acids bound to each other that can help along the way to making those strings of, large, of many amino acids that then have higher functionality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, 
I'm going to show you preliminary results by uh, Zach and Roy and Lunjun and Gary. Again, this is diffusion NMR. And what you're seeing are two different diffusion coefficients. One is due to fast diffusion of the serine. Oh, let me concentrate first on just the, the green circles. The green, oops, excuse me, oops. The green circles are, lost my pointer, there we go. The green circles are showing you on the left-hand side of this graph, very fast diffusion, and that's due to individual serine molecules in solution diffusing around with a, a fast diffusion coefficient. Then what happens? Then on the right-hand side of this graph, now we have very slow diffusion, and that's because the serine is now bound to the, the fatty acid vesicles. So that's true for the serine monomer. From fitting these, these two different slopes, um, you can back out the percent of the monomer that is bound to the vesicle. In these preliminary, uh, these are really preliminary results. So uh, as more data come in, these numbers may change somewhat. Um, at the moment, it looks like 3.3% of the serine monomer is bound to the vesicle. Now, what about those other points? So those are the green points. The other points are due to the dimer, which are the triangles, and the trimer of serine. So if you have two serines stuck together, it will do the same thing, that there'll be a fast diffusion coefficient of that serine dimer out in solution that's not bound to the membrane, and then a slow diffusion coefficient due to the serine dimer bound to the membrane. And in this case, more of the dimer is bound to the membrane than of the individual monomer. So for the numbers that we have at this very moment, um, closer to 6% of that dimer is bound to the vesicle, whereas only closer to 3% was bound for the monomer. So that could lead to an advantage of having that dimer, which could then be part of uh, a contribution to making longer chains of those amino acids. Okay, so that was our story for more compound molecules of the amino acids. What about compound molecules of the bases? Right, right at the beginning of this story, I told about uh, of this seminar, I told you about individual bases of RNA binding to vesicles of decanoic acid. And the question is, do nucleosides do so as well? So uh, for those of you who don't typically use the jargon of nucleosides, I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Uh, so let me take one little step back. Um, I told you about individual bases at the beginning of this talk, and, and the data that I showed you were from a filtration assay. And I want to tell you that the same results will happen if we do this assay now with the uh, diffusion NMR. So here's uracil, it's one of the bases in RNA. When there are no vesicles, these are the open dots, we see only one slope, so that means that those individual uracil molecules are, are diffusing free in solution. In the presence of vesicles, oh no, we're starting to see two slopes, but it's a, there's a very small contribution to the um, to the, the part that would be due to the uracil binding to the, the decanoic acid membrane. And another way of seeing that is to, to quantify to fit those slopes and to see that only 2.3% of the uracil is bound to the membrane. Now, what happens when we start to look at a molecule that is closer to what is found in RNA? So RNA is called uh, has that R because again it has ribose in it. Ribose is a sugar and the part of this molecule that is ribose is down here on the bottom. So here is ribose that is connected to our base which is uracil up on the top and together having a base plus a sugar is a nucleoside. So altogether this is a nucleoside. Um, when we look at this by diffusion NMR, and the, the heroes of this story are Mengjun Shui, Roy, uh, Roy Black, Caitlin Cornell, Gary Drobny. Uh, if we look at the uridine alone, no membrane in solution, we have one fast diffusion 
coefficient. So that means that the, the uridine finds only one environment, that aqueous environment. But again, when it's in the presence of the membrane, there are two different diffusion coefficients. There's a fast diffusion coefficient and a slow diffusion coefficient. And the upshot of fitting those data are that 6.2% of the uridine is bound to the membrane. So there's more binding to the membrane when it's in the nucleoside. And the contribution due to that is due to the sugars. So the, the presence of that sugar, and it turns out that sugars on their own bind to that membrane as well. Um, so this is also another case in which um, eventually the idea is that you would like to build up a long chain of those bases into RNA. But how do you get there, right? You need a, a long enough chain of RNA for it to have some, some function. But what advantages could there be to having the individual uh, components bound to each other or to be making larger components to have to confer some advantage? In this case, in terms of the binding to that membrane is where we get that advantage. Okay, we've been at this almost 45 minutes. And so I think it's time for me to wrap up. So I leave enough time for questions. Any type of research, you know, it takes a village. It takes a lot of us all working together in order to do this research, especially in this particular kind of, of research in which it started out with an idea from Roy, which spread to the rest of our group and then spread to additional groups as well. So it's not only my group working on this, it's the Lalich group and the Drobny group and the Lee group at the University of Washington. One thing I, I deeply appreciate about the University of Washington is how low the boundaries are between departments, that it's so easy to make collaboration between different groups. Um, and that there are programs like the astrobiology program that brings together people from different departments. Um, I'm also obviously extraordinarily grateful for the funding for this research, especially for the funding from NASA. Okay, it not only takes a, a village to do the research, you know, it also takes a village to mentor the scientists. And something that I appreciate again about the astrobiology program is the um, is how we all come together to support the scientists who are in training and also who are the faculty members. And so with that in mind, and because I have you all here today, I want to ask a question on behalf of Zach. So to fill the requirements of the UW Astrobiology program, Zach Cohen, uh, who just passed his third year, by the way, plans to do a research rotation about six months from now is his goal in the winter of 2021 or the spring quarter of 2021. Um, one of his interests is in analyzing meteorites and mission samples. And so I'd like to ask you, if you know of leads that he should be following in order to do that for his rotation, um, and especially of projects that might be compatible with uh, whatever state rules we might need to follow at that time regarding the COVID-19 virus, please do let him know. So with that, I'll return to the, the broader screen. Um, and I, I think that'll conclude, except that I would love to take your questions. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for that fantastic talk. I'll give you my applause since I'm unmuted, but uh, I'm sure everybody <laughs> will be applauding uh, along with me and maybe you'll get some virtual applause. Yes, I see some, that's very kind. Um, so yeah, so thanks again. Um, and. Um, for those of you who um, are on now or got on a little late, um, now if you have a question for Sarah, um, please type that into the chat room uh, so I can pass that on. Uh, so I see we already have one, so I'm going to start now with a question from Mike Wong, who asks, are your experiments done at standard conditions, uh, well, it just scrolled over me, are you done at standard conditions or at conditions that mimic early Earth environments? If the former, how do you think your results might change if they were done at early Earth conditions? Uh, so this is a fantastic question, obviously. Um, part of it is a question about which exactly, exactly which early earth condition could there be? So there's a, and, and I don't have a strong opinion about which one is the correct one. For example, I know that some scientists uh, favor the idea that the first protocells would have, um, have appeared in pools and others 
think about the idea that the first protocells would have appeared in oceans. Um, so I am uh, I'm open to all of those possibilities. Um, our many of our solution, many of our experiments are done starting with cases in which we have only water, um, that or or a solution that's in buffer, um, and then we're we're trying to use a pH of that solution that is not too far from what we read in the papers that should be prebiotic. But then we also want to choose a pH in which we actually have membranes in the system. So there's this, que this question of what would happen under very different conditions. For example, um, if the pH were very low or very high, then we would not have membranes anymore. And that would obviously be a big change in our, in our uh, scenario. Um, if we started looking, at the, there was this problem of what happens with high magnesium content, right? And if there is amino acid, uh, certain amino acids in the system, then that can uh, help prevent that from happening. So there, there are obviously big effects that would happen under different conditions. I hope that answered your question. All right, great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from DPW. Maybe it's Dale Weinbrenner, I'm not sure, but uh, DPW asks, do you so far have any ideas about how molecules concentrated on membranes might end up concentrated inside the membranes in order to start carrying out functions of life? Okay, so I think what you're asking is an inside versus outside question. It turns out that fatty acid membranes are very leaky. And instead of thinking of this as a bug, you should think about it as a, a feature. So if, if those amino acid membranes are super leaky, that means that small molecules are able to go inside and outside of, uh, to pass that membrane very easily. Um, research that has not been done by us, but has been done by Jack Sostas group, is showing that as those molecules become longer and longer, if they are on the inside, then they get trapped on the inside. But individual, mo individual monomers, which can help uh, continue to make that molecule longer and longer, can, can still continue to pass the membrane. So in, in our way of thinking, it is fine if those individual monomers or even dimers or trimers are binding to the outside of the membrane or the inside of the membrane, doesn't matter, they're able to pass very quickly. But the idea is that once they make those long biopolymers, if they are in the inside, if they happen to be caught on the inside, then they're, then they're caught there. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next, Alan Caswell asks, uh, once the vesicles form, are they stable over time or is there any deterioration? That's a great question because it leads to the question of um, an individual vesicle or a population of vesicles. And um, I will say that we have not watched individual vesicles for long periods of time. And that's because uh, a typical way that we would go about doing that is by fluorescence microscopy. Um, and that means that there's a fluorescent dye in the system. So if you watch a, a single vesicle over time for a long period of time, they're going to bleach out that vesicle. So it not only that, but it's also difficult to follow it because it's free floating in solution. Uh, so I am less confident about saying that each individual vesicle stays exactly as it was through time. However, it is the case that when Caitlin and when Zach are, and, and Roy are looking in the microscope and they see a population of vesicles, they can come back much, much later and still see a population of vesicles. All right, great. Uh, well, that concludes uh, the questions that are there in the chat room. So um, I think at this point we'll uh, conclude today's uh, seminar. And I wanna thank Sarah again for a fantastic presentation and thank all of you for joining remotely. So uh, with that, we'll conclude and uh, I will hopefully see all of you next week at the next Astrobiology Seminar. Thank you for hosting. Oh, thank you for joining us.